Well, welcome everyone. I'm Jessica King. I'm the pipeline manager here at Techstars. Uh, you may have received an invitation from me for this event or other events that we normally host weekly. So thanks for joining us today. This is one of our most popular sessions and we're so excited to have Stephen here from Forecaster. Stephen, if you don't mind giving a quick introduction of yourself and then we can kick things off. Sweet, yeah, I'd be happy to. Hey guys, thanks for being here. I am Stephen Plappert. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur from Louisville, Kentucky, so Kentucky boy uh, through and through. Um, I've started two companies in my career. I've taken them both through Techstars, uh, so, so that's kind of cool. My first company I started in 2013. It was a consumer gaming company called Fantasy Hub. We went through Techstars Austin, um, and that was my, my first company. I learned a ton, and uh, that company failed, which was a huge bummer, uh, but a great experience and, and really kind of set me on, on my path. Um, and I spent the next four years of my life as a fractional head of finance for early stage startups. That's where I built hundreds of financial models. Uh, I also spent six months in the woods hiking the Appalachian Trail. So I'm, I'm into that kind of stuff as well. Um, and then, yeah, I've been, I've been really pumped to be running uh, my, my current Techstars company. We went through the Anywhere class in 2020, a company called Forecaster, where all we do all day is help founders build uh, great financial models for their companies. Um, and yeah, we've been at it for four years now and just hit 2 million in ARR. So yay. yay. Oh my goodness. Four years. I can't believe it already. <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, if you have any questions for Steven, um, we'll be taking questions at the end and please feel free to use the Q and a button. If you're joining us from zoom, that will help us keep track of those questions. If you're on LinkedIn, uh, feel free to put the questions in the chat and Karina will lay them over to us. All right, go ahead, Steven. You can kick us off. Awesome. Okay, let me share my screen. And we'll get started here. Let's see. Okay, uh, so we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, lots of ground to cover. Uh, so so if I'm if I'm talking fast, it's only because I want to try to pack as much value as we can here uh, into this hour. I know you guys are we're busy people, your founders, so am I. So we got to make the most of our time. Uh, so that's what we'll do. And uh, yeah, all, we're, we're, what we're going to talk about today is the power of, of a great financial model. So I think um, financial model is something a lot of people, you know, hear and know about, but sometimes feel like they maybe it's intimidating or they're not quite sure how exactly to, to build it, how to use it, what it's for. And, and my job here today is, I think, just unlock that power for you. I think it's to try to convince you to, you know, put the hard work into building a great financial model for your company and using it you know, as a way to make better decisions, I, I, I've, I've obviously got a, a place near and dear in my heart for financial models. I've devoted my life to it in some ways, and I've just seen it provide a ton of value to, to different companies, uh, but it's not always obvious how to get started and stuff. So, so that, that's, uh, that's kind of what we're going to do today. And uh, yeah, just really appreciate you taking a little bit of time out of your day to be here. And, and I hope I can add some value um, for you. So uh, I told you all about me, so we can, we can skip over this. Uh, just for folks that are interested, you know, so Forecaster, like I mentioned, it's a tech stars company, very proudly so. Uh, we're an alternative to Microsoft Excel when it comes to building and managing your financial model. So, you know, um, if you want to build your financial model, as we say, the old fashioned way in Excel and Google Sheets, there's nothing wrong with that, right? People have done it for decades and you can do it too. And so uh, we'd, we'd love to help you no matter what route you take. But if you are interested in, a, in an online web application that's integrated with accounting and a ton of human support, you know, we give everybody an analyst that works with them collaboratively to build and manage the model. Like, if that sounds like something that you're that you're interested in, I mean, we'd be absolutely thrilled uh, to work with you and uh, kind of take that off your plate and build your financial model and manage it. Uh, I don't know if, if Jimmy from my team is here in the in the audience, but he can throw some information out about Forecaster, or we can get it to you one way or another. Um, you know, my email is Stephen at Forecaster.co. So. Anyway, uh, sh shameless plug there for, <laughs> for my company. Love to help anybody that's interested. Uh, but at the same time, like, you know, please don't feel any pressure from me to, to use Forecaster or sign up for it. You know, I obviously think it's awesome, but like, I'm just here to educate. I'm here to help. Uh, that's all we're here to do. So, you know, what we're going to do is, uh, is, is first talk about why. You know, I, I like to lead with why, because I think if you don't know why you're doing something, you're you're unlikely to kind of put your put your you know full weight and force into it. So, why should we build a financial model? What is a financial model? What's important? Um, we're going to walk through what a, a really good financial model looks like, so we know you know kind of the north star, what success looks like. Then we're going to talk about how to build your own model. We're going to talk about 
uh, the often after afterthought, but by far the most important piece, which is how to use it once you've built it to to run a better company. Um, and so, yeah, we're gonna try to get through all that in an hour. Um, and uh, and and yeah, so we'll go we'll go ahead and get it get it rocking. So, uh, what is a financial model term? I'm sure everybody on this call uh, has has heard, as I've already mentioned it <laughs> three or four times. Uh, you know, but what is what is a model, right? That that's uh, something I find a lot of different opinions come out when we ask that question. One way to think about it, the way we think about it here at Forecaster, is uh, it's a business simulator. I think the the ultimate kind of goal of a financial model is to is to describe like the mechanics of your business. How do you generate leads? How do you acquire customers? How do you monetize those customers? How do you you know um, get as much out of it as as possible? And then like what does that look like for the future? Like, where, what is it going to require to hit your financial goals? When are you going to run out of money? Like, you're just trying to simulate your business into the future um, so that you can do a few things. You can kind of tell a better story. You can make better decisions. We'll talk about that. But think think about it like that. I think it's a powerful way to think about it. It's a, it's a business simulator. You're, you're simulating your business into the future, you know, uh, and, and we think about doing that for two main reasons. One uh, is I find the one that everybody uh, loves is, which is impressing investors, raising capital, telling your story. Like investors are finance people. They speak the language of finance. So if you can tell them a story in their language, right? In the language of finance, it has a tendency to resonate really strongly. And investors often invest in founders who are, uh, let's just say, underdeveloped in their financial skills. Uh, and so oftentimes founders, unfortunately, don't don't quite manage the capital the best way possible. That adds risk. That reduces ROI. Investors don't like that. And so a financial model can be a very useful tool for helping you understand how much money to raise, when to raise that capital, where to invest it uh, within your business, like uh, asset resource allocation, essentially. And then, and then how do you tell that story? How do you tell the story of where you are right now and getting to the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow? Very powerful storytelling tool. But the other really big value of a model and the one that I think, you know, really trumps the, the fundraising use case is, is, is it's about decision making. End of the day, a model is about using the understanding that you have of your business to set realistic goals, attractive goals, reasonable goals for customer acquisition, for revenue, for hiring, for, for your expense budget, right? You're, you're setting the forecast, you're setting the plan, you're setting a financial roadmap, an operational roadmap to get where you want to go. And you're holding yourself accountable to that month in and month out. You're comparing that against your actuals and making sure that like you're actually going to hit the goals that you set and, 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 and that you're managing cash. You know, a lot of companies, myself included, we've raised $9 million most recently, four and a half this year, and, uh, and we still are burning money. And so we need, to, we need to constantly be keeping a beat on when are we going to run out of money? Uh, and, and what do we need to do to avoid that? Whether it's raise capital, increase revenue, or cut costs. So there's a lot of decisions, uh, pretty much every decision you make affects the future, right, by nature. And so we need to try to understand what are the potential impact of those decisions, be they capital strategy decisions, be they growth decisions, be they resource allocation decisions, so that we can make the best decisions that we can with the limited data we have at our disposal. So I think a model will really help you do that if you, if you run it well. Um, and as I hope you'll see today, it, you can build a great model and you can use it actively and it doesn't take a whole lot of time. Um, you know, really, it's just something that that uh, that you that you should do kind of every every month. So we'll get into that. But that's uh, that's that's why I would encourage you to build a model and, and how we use them here at, at Forecaster. Um, you know, but so so the model that's like this uh, mathematical representation of your business. There's a bunch of different calculations going on. that's turning inputs, assumptions that you have, historical data into output, which you read and consume to, to make these decisions or tell that story. Uh, and that output is a forecast. You know, that's that's why we named our company Forecaster and, and financial projections is another word for it. Pro forma, forward-looking financials. You know, it's, it's a forecast. You're trying to simulate that business and forecast forward. Um, and it's important that that, that forecast take uh, the, this structure of, of income statement, balance sheet, statement of cash flows. You want a three-statement financial model. Um, the reason why it's so important to orient your model around these three financial statements is 
you know, from an accounting perspective, these are the statements that you'll get when your books are done, when your accountant does your books or you do them late at night on a Sunday. These are the financial statements that come out and, and you need to run that comparative process to understand these are the goals that I set. This is what actually happened. If I hit goals, I should be celebrating that internally and externally. If I missed goals, I should be doing a root cause analysis. Why did I miss my revenue goal? Why did I go over budget on travel? And what am I going to do next month to either tweak my forecast or tweak my behavior to close that gap? Because I need accurate forecasting to predict growth and to predict cash. So very important to, to the usefulness of the model. Um, from a fundraising perspective, these three statements are the language of finance. These are the expectations of investors. If you roll up with a financial model uh, that's just kind of all over the place, it, it's not oriented around the financial statements, it is a signal, whether you like it or not, to investors that, that you might not have this stuff under control, and that's going to raise the risk profile. It's going to reduce the percentage chance that they invest. Um, so I really... Um, I think it's important for both sides that the model be oriented um, ar around these statements. All the models that we build at Forecaster are oriented in that way. We've also got a great library of fee free downloadable templates. They're all oriented in such a way as well. So, um, you know, models, a, a simulator, outputs a forecast. You know, there's a lot that goes into a model, uh, right? I mean, there's all, all sorts of stuff that goes into a model and yeah, I don't have to tell you guys, like we got a, we got limited time, we got limited focus, limited energy. So we got to put that focus and energy where it's most Im important, where it's most impactful. And uh, if you guys are convinced to build a financial model, and I hope you are, uh, put that energy into revenue and what we call the revenue formula. That's where 80% of your focus and modeling should be for probably every business on this call. Revenue and revenue generation is the biz biggest risk in your business. If you can generate significant revenue quickly, you are very likely to succeed. If you're unable to do that, it's tough to win. Uh, and so it's kind of a catch-22 where most companies fail, yes, because they run out of cash, but in fact, it's because they didn't generate enough revenue quickly enough to either turn a profit um, or, or attract new investment, and so they run out of cash. The cash is the symptom. The root cause is revenue. And and you're stuck in a pickle because you know, you're judged on revenue. Revenue will be the determining factor of your success, but you can't force anyone you know, legally to give, you, to give you money. You gotta earn that. You gotta, they, you gotta convince them to buy your product. You gotta earn that revenue. So you can't control it. And so it's difficult to predict. So what can you do? And in our opinion, the best thing you can do is just have a maniacal focus on the inputs, on the process. Like, how are you generating leads? How are you turning those leads into customers? How are you turning those customers into dollars? How are you turning those dollars into more dollars? Like that is what a revenue formula is. Um, and if you can understand that, break it down and, and understand the KPIs that drive that revenue engine, then you can apply a leverage to those KPIs to, 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 to create effect. And that's what we wanna do when we build a financial model. We wanna understand our revenue formula so that we can drive it. Um, so that's what we're going to do uh, next. And then we're going to jump into a, a real financial model, or it's actually a fake financial model for a fake company, but it is a real model in a sense, and it's a great model. So we'll jump into that in just a second. But um, before we do revenue formulas, right? It's the first stop on the journey. Everybody on this call that builds a financial model should do this first. Uh, and so we're going to do it for like a simple SaaS business. At Forecaster, we've done this for north of a thousand companies at this point, all pretty much tech startups. So uh, seen a lot of different shapes and sizes of revenue formulas and definitely something that we can help out with uh, if it's interesting. Um, but here's the process. So the process for, let's say, Netflix would be, you know, first saying, okay, well, what is our subscription revenue equal to? Like that's, that's, the, that's the formula part. So their subscription revenue is equal to the number of subscribers they have times the average monthly price of each subscriber. That would be the, the simplest version of a revenue formula that they could create. Um, and it's better than nothing. You know, price is a lever. They can pull it up and down. Price goes up, revenue goes up, price comes down, revenue goes down. Pretty simple. Um, but, but revenue formulas are like uh, kind of like an onion, right? You can keep peeling it back. You can keep going deeper. So how do we take this one layer deeper? Well, we could break subscribers down into subscribers we had last month, minus the ones we lost, plus the ones we gained. 
We could break that down into subscribers from last month's times the churn rate equals the ones that, that we lost. Uh, the churn rate, we could say, hey, that we know that's a driver. If churn goes up, revenue is going down. So that's that's a KPI. On the new subscriber side, we could break that down by channel. We could say, hey, that's Google, email, and Facebook that we're getting subscribers for. And we could say each one of those channels, um, maybe those are paid channels where we have a budget, a cost per click that generates traffic times the conversion rate, which generates new subscribers, right? You're just, you're trying to just take that revenue metric, which has a lot packed into it. And you're trying to break it down into all its little subcomponents and the, and the KPIs that drive it so that you can, so that you can understand where you can apply leverage. Because when you just look at revenue, it's very difficult to understand uh, what's going to drive the needle the most. When you break it down in this way, you have five inputs on the screen and you can start to use your model like a, a sandbox. You can start to play around with the metrics and the values of these metrics to understand what's going to drive the needle the most. Is it a change in price? Is it a change in conversion? Maybe it's reducing my cost per click. What would drive revenue the most? That should stack rank the metrics from a prioritization standpoint. That should be where your mind is, is, is focused from, from you know a, a, you know a day to day standpoint and trying to drive revenue right and so I think knowledge is power on this and the more you can break it down and understand it the better off you'll be uh, revenue formulas get a lot more complicated than what we're seeing on the screen so this is just a simple example for us for a monthly SaaS business you know if you're out there thinking man my revenue <laughs> model is way more complicated than that you're not alone a lot of people have complicated business models we ourselves have multiple different product lines and different Different revenue, different revenue lines. So it's not always easy building a, a revenue formula. And if um, if modeling like isn't your cup of tea, if you're not like a you know analytical thinker by design, you know, then um, then I encourage you to, to to get some support on this. Something that uh, that we'd be happy to help you with, even if you're not interested in forecaster, even just to email back and forth with our analyst team and get some free free guidance and advice. Something that we're very open to doing. So um, yeah, I think it's. First off on the train, got to get this right in, in order for everything else uh, to be built because everything else flows um, from, the, from the revenue formula. So, okie dokie. Um, moving right along here. Uh, this is a, a, a little write-up um, uh, and I'll give credit where credit's due. A, a tech star is great named Troy Hennikoff. He was the managing director of Techstars Chicago for many years, taught me how to build my first model. Uh, he came up with this fake company, and we still use it today as a, as an example. So just skim this, you know, not gonna not gonna quiz anybody on it, but get a sense of this company, and uh, and then we're gonna dive into their model, and we're gonna say, hey, what what makes this a great model, and uh, and what should we be shooting for uh, when we build uh, our own models? Okay, so hopefully, uh, hopefully, you guys got a general sense. Consumer company, subscription box company, um, a couple different, a couple different uh, revenue streams. I think got subscription revenue, advertising, as well as some add-on, just more transactional purchases as well. Um, so let me pop out here. We'll jump over here. So this is the uh, Dollar Cave Club model, and this is this is also forecaster. So this is. This is our product, it's my baby. Um, and this is um, this is uh, the financial model for Dollar Cave Club, make it a little bit bigger just so everybody can see. So I uh, wanna walk through this model and say, hey, what makes this a great model? What are the core components of a great financial model that you should have built in your model, regardless of where it lives? Excel, Google Sheets, Forecaster, wherever, you know, regardless of where it lives, what are the core components? So, um, Input output is a big one. So as you notice we have an assumption section and a financial section. Assumptions are where the model is built and managed. That's where you do all the calculations and everything like that. Um, and we have it broken down by customer acquisition, revenue, people, expenses, the balance sheet. You know, we have it organized across kind of the financial unit of the company. I think that that's really smart to do. Um, just organize your assumptions in that way. 
so that you can describe you know, the, the company and how it works. We'll come back to this. And then on the output side, you want those three financial statements, right? You want to be able to see, hey, on the income statement basis, where are we are right now in terms of revenue? You know, where are we going to end the year? Where are we going to end next year? You know, do we feel good about those goals? What about the cash flow statement? You know, where are we at in terms of cash right now? We've got 1.3 million in the bank. When are we going to turn a profit? Looks like uh, August of next year is when we become cash flow positive. We've got a million in the bank. We're good. Right? You, you want that visibility into the financial health of the company to the output so that you can make decisions and tell your, your story so that you can, you know, put that annual income statement into a pitch deck, you know, that kind of stuff as well. So input outputs, the first thing you want assumptions and financials both represented in the model. Um, and then on the assumption side, you want a monthly model that goes out the next 60 months. Um, if you're if you're not thinking about fundraising at all and it's just for operations, you know, something like 24 months is more than reasonable. That's about about as far into the future as you're going to be able to see anyway. But if you're fundraising, you know, um, in 24 months, your, your business probably doesn't look like a pot of gold, you know, you're still building it. Um, and so you need to go out five years so you can show investors, you know, what does the size of the prize really look like for this business? And so you can tell that kind of longer term narrative of scale. So that's, it's very important um, five-year model for, for fundraising, but monthly, it's gotta be monthly. Can't be quarterly, can't be annual. It's gotta be monthly. Now it's very useful to look at it quarterly or to look at it annually. Like, so, so roll-ups are good. But, but you got to forecast monthly. And that's because, you know, a lot, as we all know, I think a lot happens in a quarter and in a year. So, so you got to make sure that you have that good visibility into the operating um, health of the company. And so monthly forecasting, monthly goal setting, monthly accountability, monthly cash flow management, that is really uh, what every company should be doing to just be a good shepherd of, their, of, of the capital that they do receive or the capital that they have. And just making sure that you are setting yourself up for success. You know, uh, if you are missing your goals, you want to find that out as soon as possible so that you can change your behavior or change your goals, you know, so that so that you at least have an accurate picture of what the future will hold so you can make decisions based on a, a, a from a position of, of power. So monthly model, five-year model, all three statements. These are very core kind of components of what a great model looks like. Um, and, and then it's, and from there, it's, it's all about, like I said, the revenue formula. So let's, let's look at that, you know, from a customer acquisition standpoint, Dollar Cave Club, they've got four different customer acquisition channels, referrals, Facebook ads, Google ads, and organic. Um, and we can see, you know, the customer acquisition forecast for each channel. We can see most of it's coming from organic. We can dig into something like Facebook and see we've got traffic and subscribers, We've got a budget, we've got a cost per click. These blue lines here are the inputs. So we can adjust those and, and kind of flex the model. That's how you're tweaking the knobs and pulling the, pulling the levers and stuff. But you want good representation of the, of, the, of the mechanics of the revenue model. So channel by channel customer acquisition, how does each one of those funnels work on the customer acquisition side? That's very important to have represented in your model so you have an accurate picture. Um, and then same on the revenue side, you know? Uh, for Dollar Cave Club, most of the revenue is coming from subscriptions. So we've got that 4% monthly churn, that $29.99 price. But we've got a little bit of we've got a little bit of uh, of revenue coming in from, from the add-on side. Uh, $70 price, 4% purchasing those add-ons. So we've got those mechanics represented. And if we need to add something else, you know, we can add from in forecast, it's kind of a nice library of different revenue models you can build from and you can mix and match and customize and yada, yada. Uh, or if you're building from scratch in Excel, you just kind of have to go through that um, thought process like we did in the in the presentation of saying, hey, how does my revenue formula work? And then how can I tie that up, you know, with with Excel formulas and stuff? So but you want to have good representation and good insight into the revenue mechanics because that's where most of the risk is. You know, and then you keep on going down the line, right? You've got the people section of the model. This is who you're going to hire. When are you going to hire them? What are you going to pay them? Um, and you, and you want to have those people in the model so that, that you know, you can forecast your costs. For a lot of uh, companies, mine included, um, people are the majority of your costs. People are more than 80% of our operating expenses here at Forecaster. Um, and then you have all your non-people expenses, right? You've got your 
professional fees, your marketing, your general and admin, your rent, your travel, all this kind of stuff. Um, so you want to have those forecasted as well. So you understand what your expense base is, if you're losing money, when you're going to run out of money, you know, and similar deal, you know, you can add expenses and common ways to forecast expenses would be tie it to revenue, tie it to people as your people grow, the, 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 the expense grows, or maybe just a kind of a custom expense where you just put in the expense amount and grow it monthly, grow it annually, grow it quarterly, something like that is, fi is fine to do as well. Um, but, but you want to have those expenses covered in there too. So, so kind of um, in, in summary, monthly model, five-year model, outputs all three statements, good visibility into the revenue formula, you know, good healthy forecasting on the expense side to make sure you're catching all the important ones. Uh, I think if you do that, you'll have a model that will be uh, viewed favorably by investors. So it's going to help you tell your story and raise capital. You'll also have a model that positions yourself well to, you know, to grow your company as, as, well, as, you, as, as well as you can, to set good goals, to hold yourself accountable to those goals, and just make sure you understand, you know, where things are at from a, from a cash flow uh, management perspective. So, uh, so that's kind of what success looks like there. And I want to, while we're in a model, I'm going to talk about this a little uh, later as well um, in the how to use it effectively portion. But I want to go ahead and, and, and kind of illuminate some of the ways that we would use this model. So three things we're going to go through, which is kind of we call knowing your numbers, you know, setting goals, managing cash. So, so on, the, on the knowing your numbers side and kind of the, you know, uh, knowledge is power side, one of, the, one of the ways that we would use this model is we would kind of zoom out, let's say, to look at it in, the, in, in, in a big picture, right? And as a management team, we would ask ourselves, what is our goal? You know, what is our goal with this business? Um, for most of us, I would say it's by driving revenue, right? Driving revenue is the goal. We're sitting at 15.3 million in 2027. And our charge as a management team is to, you know, <laughs> if 15 is great, 16 is better, right? So how do we do more? Um, and so one of the ways we would do that, just, you know, going back to the sandbox concept is just start playing around with the model. So we'd say, you know what? We're charging 29.99 right now. What if we charge thirty nine ninety nine? What would that do to to revenue? Uh, jumps it up to nineteen point nine, um, and so we say, okay, that's great. Well, <laughs> we should charge thirty nine ninety nine, right? That's a, that's a no brainer, you know. But obviously, it's not so simple, right? I mean, everything's connected. If re if if we charge more, maybe more customers are going to churn. So we so we go back into the model and we say, okay, you know, we raised our price by thirty three percent, twenty nine to thirty nine. What if our churn also went up by 33%? Stands, stands to reason that that could, that could be the case. Then, then what would revenue be? Um, in this case, it would be 17.7. And it may not be obvious, but we just learned something really interesting there, which is that percent for percent, if you're changing price or changing churn for this business in this context, price is more impactful because we're higher than that 15.3 we were at originally. So if I can afford to change my price to $39.99 and not have the churn go up higher than, you know, well, if it goes up by 33%, we're, 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 we're good. Like we're, we're in better off shape. We, we, I could kind of take this, I could run this out. I could say, well, what if churn was 6%? Would we still be better off? Yes, we would. We'd be, we'd be quite significantly better off. What if churn was 7%? Would we still be better off? you know, we're kind of close now. So we'd say, well, maybe 7% is the break point. That is like the bound of an experiment. Partition a portion of the traffic, run it into 39.99, track their behavior for three months. If the monthly churn is less than 7%, it's objectively a better business. We're going to generate more revenue in that business model by raising the price and stomaching the higher churn. So we should probably make that move. And those types of moves are moves that I think a lot of founders make uh, kind of shooting from the hip, and I totally get it. Uh, but you can you can use the financial model to, you know, kind of understand what potential impacts are of those decisions on ways that you can optimize the business model to achieve more success, generate more revenue, um, and and get more comfortable with what metrics matter most. You know, um, another one being something like conversion, right? Like maybe. Maybe the churn rate doesn't move at all because people that buy are comfortable with it, but maybe the conversion is what changes. Maybe some people are saying, hey, $39.99, too rich for my blood. So maybe the conversion instead of at 2%, maybe it's one and a, and a third. Maybe it goes down by 33%. Then we could say, okay, well, what does that do to revenue? 
Um, that brings it down a lot. You know, we were at 15.3 originally, went up to 19.9. Now we're at 13.5. That we're worse off, you know? So that tells us yet something else, which is conversion is the most impactful metric, then price, then churn. You know, so if I'm running this company, if I have limited resources, limited cognitive energy, I'm going to say, hey, if we can move the needle on conversion, we're going to get the biggest bang for the buck there. So let's like, guys, I want three ideas for how we're going to drive the needle on conversion. Secondarily, how do we bump price? Because price is impactful. Only if we have resources and space for it, am I even going to worry about churn rate mitigation? Because it's, it's the third most impactful metric. Conversion and price are the two that, are, that, that drive the needle more. So, so there's that element of just like being aware of the realities of your business model functionally and using that to, 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 in, to influence priority, right? I mean, one of the things the model doesn't know is for all the model knows, the conversion rate could be 100%. You as a founder know that's not true. So that's where the human element comes in is like, you have to read what the model's telling you and, uh, and you have to assess and you say, well, if our conversion rate's already gold standard and I don't think I can move the needle at all, well, I'm not going to focus on that. But if I think that there's room to move conversion, it's going to, it's going to, it's going to yield better results. So, so the model, I always tell people, it doesn't tell you the answer. It just, it just gives you a way of looking at the information to try to, you know, make the best decision that you can. So that's one way. Once you stand the model up, uh, you can play around with it and, and you can use it to assess the business and, um, and, and learn, you know, kind of, uh, kind of what, what, uh, what drives the needle the most. The, ne the next thing I would say here is about goal setting. I think in my career, I've been an entrepreneur for 10 years. Uh, so much of it is just about execution. It's just raw execution. Whoever can, Techstars' mantra used to be get shit done. And I loved it. And uh, and like and it, like that was, I mean, that was like, uh, it's so true. Like at the end of the day, as a founder, like that's just what you got to do. And, um, and, and it's so important. And a big part of that is setting goals. A big part of that is setting goals that you and your team can hold yourself accountable for, that are realistic, that are attractive, and just managing to that really tightly. And goals are all about the future. Financial goals, customer acquisition goals, revenue goals. It's, it's all a game of the future, which is a game of forecasting. So one of the big ways you'd use a model is sit down, you and your team, your co-founders, use the model and say, hey, we're here we are right now on customer acquisition. Maybe you're acquiring customers. Maybe you're pre-market, wherever you are. Say, okay, well, what, is it, what does it look like next few months? What should it look like end of year? What do we think it's going to look like end of next year? You know, and like, where do we want to be on revenue and customer acquisition? <laughs> what do we think is reasonable? Like there's a Goldilocks zone between like what's attractive to you and to investors and what's reasonable, like what, what you think you're actually going to get done. You got to find that Goldilocks zone, set that roadmap for the company um, and, and use that to hold yourself accountable and to manage towards. Because once you have goals set in this way, then this like big lofty goal, like, you know, maybe our goal is to get, to, uh, you know, 2 million in ARR by the end of next year, right? So I could scroll over and see, do we get there? 180K in, in monthly revenue. Yep, we're above that goal. So then I can go to customer acquisition and say, well, you know, what does that mean for me right now? Well, that means for me right now, I need to get 174 new customers this month, 181 next month, 190 the month after that. You know, if I'm going to get that done, um, let's see, I need to get a, well, I guess we just, we just changed this, a one and a third conversion rate on organic. These are metrics that I can track. These are, these are action items that I can kind of take and align my team around. So that's, that's the goal here is like taking your big goals representing them based on the mechanics of the company and then managing to that. That's a really like kind of big superpower of modeling is just making sure that you are kind of setting those goals and communicating them, holding yourself accountable, that, that kind of stuff. So that's a big one. And then the other one is cash flow management. Once, once you've set all those goals, you know, for customer acquisition, for revenue, for your hiring plan, et cetera, end of the day, you're going to be able to come over to cash flow and say, okay, well, if we hit this plan, you know, uh, which is an if, right? If we hit this plan, you know, we're going to turn a profit in June of 2024, you know, with a $1.3 million buffer. So in this business, we have no cash concerns. We're very financially uh, healthy here in this business. Now, <laughs> my model doesn't look like this. Your model probably doesn't either. Like, you know, it's, it, it will probably run into the red at some point. And so you have to say, okay, well, you know, let's just say if the model did say I'm going to run out of money in December of next year, 
Okay, then I, that's that's when I'm going to run out. I'm going to watch that every month. So I'm going to see that kind of creeping up if it does. And then I'm going to ask myself every month, okay, here I am, September 2023. I've got 15 months worth of runway. Do I need to do anything different? You know, and if and, if, and that answer is probably no, I got plenty of time. But once I get to nine months, I'm going to say, okay, well, unless I have line of sight to profitability or could cut costs and get there and want to do that, I need to be thinking about that next round. So what's my pipeline looking like? How am I approaching new investors? Am I on track to hit milestones that I need to hit in order to raise that next round? Those gears need to start turning because I don't want to get into a cash crunch. And so that's something that we see a lot of founders just, you know, not, not watch closely enough is they'll do the quick burn analysis of, okay, I'm burning 40K a month right now and I've got 400K in the bank. So there we go. I've got 10 months worth of runway, but your business is a, is a living, breathing organism. So next month, the month after, the month after, they're not always the same. And so that 10 months could turn into 15. It could turn into six really quickly, depending on if you hit or beat your, your forecast. Uh, and so if you're not watching it month to month, you can think you have a lot, plenty of runway, but I've seen it a lot where all of a sudden that runway shortens really quite a bit because you went over budget and you came in light on revenue. And all of a sudden, like you're kind of... Uh, you're in a tough spot. So I think that's the other big thing from a fiscal responsibility standpoint is using the model to get a sense of your of, of, the, of your cash flow, uh, of your runway, and making the critical decisions that you need to make in order to avoid you know the the, the cliff, so to speak. So um, those are I think some of the three kind of main use cases here. You know, understanding the business, setting goals, um, and, and managing cash. And yeah, I, ho I hope that this like, uh, I hope this creates maybe a good picture for like what a great model looks like and, uh, and, and what you could use it for. Um, and that, and that, that uh, inspires you, you know, to, 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 to create one. Um, so that's what we got here in the, in the platform. I'm gonna spend a little bit of time switching back to uh, kind of close this out and then we'll, we'll open it up for, for questions. Cause I see we got plenty Plenty to go through. So, um, so how do we build a model? That's always a question that we get asked. And, you know, there is a few different approaches. Like, uh, of course, is the fully DIY approach in Excel, where you start with the blank spreadsheet, build it all yourself. Uh, very educational, very time consuming, depending on your technical expertise and finance. That's either easy to do or hard to do, et cetera. But that's a route. Um, a mid, a midterm, like a middle route uh, would be we have a very great library of, of templates that we can share with you. Uh, they're free to download. They cover businesses of all shapes and sizes. My only ask is that if you do use one of those templates, you hold yourself accountable and you do customize it to your business. They're not meant to be used out of this off the shelf. They're meant to kickstart you and to do a lot of the work for you. But your business is 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 a special snowflake, right? In some ways, right? It's like it's 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 unique, and so you you have to adjust the model to your business to make it custom. Or it, or it just won't work. So don't get lazy if you do that. Uh, and then there's the paid approach. You know, you could work with an expert like Forecaster. We do it every day. We, we bring on about 60 new startups every every month. And all we do all day uh, is build great financial models uh, with, with, with our startup customers. We've got a team of nine analysts and that's their job. That's, that's what they do. They build hundreds of financial models. Uh, so they'd be more than happy to do that for you as well. So in, in terms of, you know, optionality, those I think are, are three paths you could take. No matter what path you take, these are the kind of the nine steps that 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 occur. Um, depending on the path, some of them are done for you, uh, or some of them are not, right? Um, but the first thing you got to do is get an understanding of that revenue formula. So just sit down, you know, uh, whiteboard, Excel spreadsheet, in your head, even if that's what makes sense. Like, get a clear understanding of how top of funnel, uh, top of funnel, right? How do leads come in the top of the funnel? Conversion. How are those leads becoming customers? Price. How are those customers becoming dollars? Uh, retention. How are those dollars becoming more dollars? Right. Like those are kind of the four building blocks of any revenue formula: top of funnel, conversion, price, and retention. You got to describe that using math. Essentially, there's no way around it. That's that's the input to a financial model. So you got to get that logical understanding, um, like we did, like we did, kind of in the in the presentation. Steps two and three. There, those are those assumption sections. You got to turn that logical understanding into a monthly forecast going out the next five years, right? And so you have to, you know, depending on what you use, which which route you take, you got to either use Excel or, or Forecaster or work with the analyst, whatever, to like to flush that out, to kind of, to actually build those calculations, to forecast each customer acquisition channel, 
to forecast each revenue stream and connect those so that you ultimately end up with a revenue forecast that you can use to set goals for your revenue that are attractive but, but reasonable. So revenue is where you should start. It's where most of your energy should be put in. Um, and once you get revenue done structurally and you kind of shape the forecast to your liking, then you can build out the rest. Then you can, then you can look and say, let me work my way down and say, well, what, what, what are the direct expenses? What are the cost of goods sold? What expenses do I incur for every incremental dollar of revenue? I could make those a percentage of revenue, you know, payment processing, database and hosting, direct labor. Uh, so that way, as I shape my revenue forecast, those are going to shape automatically. Um, so I so I kind of flush that out in the model. Then I'm looking at the hiring plan. Who am I hiring? What am I paying them? When am I hiring them? You know, forecasting their their costs. If they are a near term hire, I, I I put them in discreetly. If they're a hire in the future, I might put them in dynamically. So I might say, hey, for every 20 new customers that we acquire, we need a new sales rep. Or for every 50 active customers we have, we need a customer service rep. Or every six months, I want to hire a new developer. So I may make a, what we call a modeled hire so that those hires go out and are tied to the model. So as you scale, the model stays, you know, kind of in line with reality. Um, and then all your operating expenses, just kind of think through what are the big expenses that you have uh, and, and how could you forecast those either as a percentage of revenue or per person or that kind of thing. Um, and then there's the balance sheet, step six. I hate talking about the balance sheet uh, because it's either really easy for people that, that are like finance people or it's super complicated and there's just no way around it. And I wish there was a better way to describe it and to help and that kind of stuff. I just say like, if you know finance, you're probably like, yep, I get it. I get a balance sheet. If finance isn't your cup of tea, um, there's just a lot of lingo and mumbo jumbo on the balance sheet. It's very technical. It is critical though. Uh, unless you're like a really, really simple cash business, the balance sheet is critical for understanding your cash flow and your runway, which is why it is kind of a necessary evil for a lot of people. Um, it, it's just, there's no way around it. It's it, your, your profit, your net income, that's, it's not the same as your cash flow. So the balance sheet is what bridges that, but bridges the income statement and the cash flow statement. So you got to build that out. Our templates, you know, you know, provide a lot of uh, guidance on, on balance sheets. Of course, if you work with Forecaster, we take care of that for you. Uh, or you can all, we also have a lot of great written content on our blog about, about balance sheets. And that's all I can really say generically, because, you know, for some businesses, it's simple for other businesses. It is, it is very complex. So you just kind of have to work through the, the nuances of that. Um, and then once you get through that, you've got all the, the core information of a model. It's just about reorganizing that information into the context of the monthly statements um, and then rolling those up annually to get that kind of bird's eye view. So I know that's not a, a complete silver bullet on, on building models. It is fairly uh, complicated, but I hope that gives you some insight into how you could get started and the, and the different paths that, that you could take. Um, and then I'm going to see. Okay, cool. Um, so as far as like using it effectively, and this is the last piece, uh, the first thing you want to do, and we call this the monthly finance playbook. I encourage everybody who, who is on this call and builds a model Set a one or two hour standing meeting on your calendar with your co-founders and force yourself to do finance every month. It doesn't need to take a lot of time, one or two hours a month. It will really change the way that you, that you view and run your business. And the first thing you do is use the model to set a forecast. Uh, and then you put the model on a shelf. I tell everybody, like, the model is not the most important thing. It's, it, is, it is an important thing, but it is far from the most important. Like, you got to go sell your customers and talk to your customers and build your product and, like, raise money and hire people. So go, go do all that stuff. Um, and while you're doing that stuff, make sure you have a system of tracking your KPIs and metrics so that at the end of the month, you can compare. You can say, hey, these are all the goals that I set. This is what actually happened. If I hit my goals, great. I should announce and celebrate that. If I miss my goals, no worries. Like, you know, thick skin. But like, why did I miss my goals? What was the root cause? And what do I need to change? What do I need to tweak? To, to close that gap for the next month. So you just kind of work down the way, way through the model, you compare forecast to actual, and you just ask yourself, is this model still attractive? Is it still set to hit my goals? Is this model reasonable? Do I still believe this forecast is reasonable? If you check both those boxes, then great, move on to next month. If, if some of those things are giving you heartburn, maybe it's time to, to tweak the model. And it's this circular process that you run every month, uh, <laughs> 
but from the dawn of time until 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 your company's over, right? It's just something that never ends, uh, just like you know anything else that we're doing. So, so yeah, that's what you do, um, and I think it'll really help you hit your goals and, and manage cash. So that's what I got, and I know we got a lot of questions. So just before we get to them, I'll just say uh, everybody on this webinar does get a twenty percent off uh, discount. So uh, we 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 love working with the TechStars universe, and so if you are interested in using Forecaster, we'd be thrilled to work with you. You get an analyst assigned to your account. They're with you through the lifetime of your subscription. Super, uh, super kind of human-led approach to, to building these models and maintaining them. Um, and we've got a few different plans. Some that start at 500 bucks a month and you get a 20% off that. Uh, going all the way up to fractional CFOs. We're, we're a CFO uh, for, for dozens of companies. So uh, yeah, just a little bit about kind of Forecaster and how we work. Uh, I will say, we're not the cheapest option out there, that's for sure. Uh, but but we aspire to be the best, but the best option for really building and managing a great a great financial model. So yeah, just uh, really appreciate the time, and we've got I think plenty of time for for some questions. So let's uh, let's fire away. Yeah, Stephen, and thanks so much for sharing all that information and also um, sharing that offer as well. So really appreciate that. Uh, we have a question from Melissa. Or, so she was wondering, when is the, what is the stage for a model like this um, when it comes to the stage of your startup? Because if you're very early, is this appropriate for you? If you're just starting at the idea stage, can you share more information about that? That is such a great question. Uh, and so here's what, here's, what, here's what we say. We say, think about your model like you think about your product and build an MVP model when you're at that kind of idea MVP stage and then expand that model as you grow. So, so to describe that, right? It's like when we, when, we, when we take our product to market, like we have to build an MVP product. And that is just a, the core essential of what we think the product is. There's a lot of assumptions that we're making. We take that MVP product, we push it into the market. As we do that, we get data from the market and we iterate and pivot and change our product until it becomes something more stable and something more secure, something that we can scale uh, later on. And th the financial model is the same way. It is literally like a simulation of the business. So build an MVP model, a super simple model, simple customer acquisition, simple revenue, simple hiring plan, just something simple you can wrap your arms around, you can use to get a directional idea of the validity of the business and get started. Don't go too deep because it's false precision. And then as you push the business into the market, as you get data from the market, you should be iterating and changing and pivoting that model as your business iterates and changes. And you should be expanding the, the resolution in that model where you can. And as your business stabilizes, so, so will the model. Um, so that's what we encourage. Like, I think everybody should build a financial model right from when they decide that they really want to put their energy and effort into the company but just don't over-engineer it. Build a very simple financial model, just get the juices flowing and then expand it over time. Great, thank you. Uh, so how are you calculating and creating your assumptions over time from conversion and acquisition, acquisition to ensure that both is accurate and believable before you have the data? So for example, are you taking general data and trends um, from conversions like things on Facebook ads and website traffic? So I know that was a very lengthy question. <laughs> Let me know if you need me to cover it again. No, I think it's a good question. And I'm just bringing up like, we always kind of, uh, you know, lead with uh, lead with transparency. So I'll show you guys like, this is the real financial model that we use here at Forecaster to kind of set up uh, our business and everything like that. Now we've been operating with some serious history, right? Like we've got a lot of customer acquisition in here. And like, even if I use an example, like other strategic networks, all these blue cells are, are us keying in actual. So once you have actuals, you can key those in and you can have an understanding of your historical performance. And then you can look at historical performance and look at the future and make sure those things are kind of in line, right? So like, well, as you stand the business up, it gets easier and easier to, to do this. But like, you know, back at the beginning when we were here right at, right at the start, we were forced to, to come up with these assumptions, like you said. And so the way that you want to do that is the first thing I like to tell everybody is take the pressure off. Like, yeah, you're going to be wrong. Just accept that. Don't worry too much about it. Just initially, once you've built it, just go with your gut. You should, two things should be driving you. One is what needs to happen in order for me to hit my goals? Like maybe I want to raise a seed round in 10 months and I think I need to get to 10K and MRR to do that. So like literally how many customers do I need to sell at what price point to get there? 
I, I got to make that happen. So I put that in the model. That's where I start, right? I start by just kind of shaping that in the model. And I just put what I think makes sense. I just kind of go with my gut. I put what numbers in there that just make sense to me generally. And then what you want to do is crowdsource that around. So once you've got assumptions in there, like, you know, we've got... Um, like, you know, a good, 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 a good example would be, you know, number of partnerships and leads per partnership, right? These are just assumptions. We would then push that around and say, hey, you know, uh, mentors of ours, investors of ours, other founders I know, I just kind of throw it up to them and say, hey, what do you guys think about these base assumptions for the business? I know you don't know my business, but what do you think? And if everybody's like, yeah, it seems reasonable to me, then it's probably a pretty good place to start and just make sure that you have a system within your business of actually tracking the actual data so that you can do what we're doing here and update that with actual data every single month, you know, and those and those assumptions become data over time. If everybody's instead like, oh, dude, no way you're getting a 20% conversion rate, like you're probably going to get a 5% conversion rate, then you're probably like, okay, I probably, I probably went overboard on that. Let me pull that back down. So I think go with your gut, um, you know, uh, crowdsource, like talk to other folks that, that know, but just commit to the fact that, that you're not going to be right. And that you just need to, you know, update those assumptions as you go. And like the next six to nine months, as you kind of build, build out the business, you'll start to get better and better assumptions and dial it in. Um, and so just like kind of uh, take, take the model initially with a very healthy grain of salt, um, but don't, you know, don't kind of rely solely on yourself, but, you know, use, use the power of, of the network, whether it's the Techstars network or your own personal network, you know, to kind of crowdsource reasonability, if that makes sense. But, but setting assumptions is one of the hardest things to do in, in, in financial models. So I think, um, yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Yeah, actually, this next question kind of goes well with that, too, of when you're talking about pulling these different levers um, for your assumptions. So Scott was wondering, if you understand that you can pull those levers to create changes in the financial model, how do you translate that and demonstrate it in your deck? Is there like a specific slide that you would recommend or something, mm. a graphic or anything that you would pull over? Yeah, totally. So it's a, it's a great, it's a great question. And um, we even at Fortes, we do out of onboarding, we create something called a model cheat sheet, just a one page PDF. It shows the output of the model, but it also shows the metrics that drive, you know, the, the, the revenue engine the most. And so at the end of the day, investors are trying to suss out like, are you the kind of founder? Is this the kind of business that's going to generate a big return? They know revenue is where the risk is. So if you can give them confidence and, and, and give them uh, assurances that like you understand revenue, you're going to drive you up your conversion rate. And so I think in a pitch deck, if you do the work in the model and you see kind of the stack ranking of, of metrics in your model, like we did for Dollar Cave Club, a killer slide would be, to, would be like revenue power metrics or something like that, right? Some kind of a thing that shows those things stack ranked. And you talk to the investor and say, hey, we, th we, we think about this business really critically. We've, you know, we've like done the analysis in our business model with our metrics. And we've seen that conversion has a 6x greater impact on our revenue engine than churn. So conversion is a big focus of ours right now. That's where a lot of resources are going. Uh, and we're really making gains there. Like comments like that, slides like that that drive investor confidence, which drives investment. We did that ourselves at Forecaster. We saw that uh, price had a 6X greater uh, like impact on revenue than churn. So we've focused a lot on, okay, well, like how do we, how do we get, <laughs> how do we get price up? So, sorry, sorry for anybody that's in, interested, but like that's, a, you know, it's something that, uh, that we focus on a lot and has made a big difference in our business. So um, yes, that, that's absolutely the type of thing you want to be showcasing to investors that you're the type of founder that puts that critical thought um, into their business. Awesome. Thank you. So I know we have a lot of questions, but I think we have time to cover one more. So if we didn't get your question, please email me at startups at techstars.com and I can relay them over to your team, Stephen, if that's okay. Yes. Yes. I want to answer all the questions. Yeah. Put my email in the chat too. So anybody's awesome. welcome, welcome Thank to just throw them my way. Thank you. Um, but I think this question has been asked a lot in different ways from the audience. So we wanted to know, are there any resources that your team has available um, that are free resources that they can access, whether it's templates or the blog that you mentioned, where can founders reach those resources? A hundred, a hundred percent. So one of the big kind of like and I honestly, I'll give credit where credit's due. Like I went through Techstars in my first company. And one of the things that always stuck with me was the give first mantra of like, you give 
just to give and just to like provide value. And that has a way of in a karma type of way, just coming back around. And so as we do these webinars and stuff like that, we have a very educational led approach. Uh, and like, we want, we're on a mission to make sure everybody gets a great financial model. You know, obviously I'd love for you to use your orchestra, but like, I don't, I don't care if you use forecaster. I just care that you have a great model. So yes is the answer. Um, we have a really solid library of free financial model templates. You can go to forecaster.co slash templates. So forecaster.co slash templates for that. Oh, there we go, Jimmy. Jimmy on the spot right there, baby. Okay, so we got templates there on the website, lots of resources, a written blog as well. Um, so like, that's a great place to go for a free template. That's a great place to go for written content on how to build a model, how to use a model, how to present one to investors. There's recorded versions of webinars that we give on the topic as well. Uh, we've got a great ebook that we did with HubSpot called the Monthly Finance Playbook, which goes deeper into um, the, the playbook that I walked through on that kind of how to, how to keep good monthly hygiene financially. And then the other thing I'll say is like, you know, it's, it's, it's a, there's supply constraints to this, right? <laughs> it's only got nine financial analysts, but like we want to just help you build a great model. So like if you're like, hey, I just am not in a position to spend hundreds of dollars a month on this, but I really want a great model and I'm using my using one of your templates, but I get hung up. Like, please don't hesitate. Send me an email, right? Send, send us, send me an email directly. Just say, hey man, I was on your webinar. I'm using this template. Here's my question. I will route you to an analyst. We will help you. Uh, we often, often can. And like, you know, if I get a hundred emails, it might take me weeks to get to them all or whatever. So be, you know, <laughs> be patient or whatever. But but please, like, just don't, 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 uh, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, we want to help you, and uh, and 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 that's just kind of the business that that we are. So yes, uh, that's that's what I would that's what I would say. Yeah, and I can definitely attest to that. Stephen and his team are are very giving, and they love to help founders. And so please take him up on that. But thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, we will have this recording available to everyone that has registered for the event as well. So that way you can reflect on all of the resources that Stephen has shared. But again, a big, big thank you. We've already, and I appreciate everyone that has participated as well. You've been super active in the chat. So we we love that here. And I just wanted to share from Techstars as well that we have a pitch series happening next month. Um, it's a three-part pitch series event, completely free to attend. I'll put it in the chat for everyone to see as well. Um, so that way you can register. It does start next week, so don't miss out on it. Um, but if you can't make the first session, that's okay. You can still go to the rest of the sessions. Um, so I just put that in the chat for everyone. But Stephen, have a great day. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, see ya.